Part one, the trouble with we. We live in a watery world. More accurately, we are a watery world. Metonymically, temporarily, partially, and particularly. Water irrigates us, sustains us, comprises the bulk of our own soupy flesh. We are all adrift, afloat, swimming or sinking, flowing, floundering, trickling down, welling up, overflowing, rerouting, recharging. We are all bodies of water. Yet it isn't easy to begin with a we. Granted, its inclusions are intentionally abundant. This we invites a watery kinship with other thoroughly watery humans. Both the baby you may have bathed into being upon your own amniotic seas, as well as the guy who sat beside you on the bus, they are made mostly of water. But this we also connects us to all of the more than human aqueous bodies into whom we leak and seep and spill. The eucalypt, the dung beetle, the kelp frond, the whale, as bodies of water, our we expands also geologically and meteorologically to include rock-bound and sandy-bottomed bodies too. Oceans, rivers, aquifers, subterranean streams, clouds, storms, swamps, and soils, all dripping or tidal or damp. We all circulate through one another in a more than human hydrocommons. And this is a beautiful idea. But as U.S. lesbian feminist Jewish mother and poet Adrienne Rich wrote in her influential 1985 essay, Notes Towards a Politics of Location, quote, The problem was we did not know whom we meant when we said we. A hydrofeminism, that is, a watery feminism attentive to the lessons of feminist scholarship and praxis, knows that we is also the most dangerous word. We who are many, Adrian Rich wrote, and we who do not want to be the same. So this trouble with we is a long-standing feminist preoccupation. As Australian-born queer feminist Sarah Ahmed has recently put it, quote, feminist histories are histories of the difficulty of that we, a history of those who have had to fight to be part of a feminist collective or even had to fight against a feminist collective in order to take up a feminist cause. From suffrage to reproductive justice to equal pay in the second shift, any feminist victories have never been victories for any kind of unified we, not locally, not globally. In other words, feminists have long recognized the potential violence of the we. We are all in this together. We have the right. We belong. We demand. We can do it. We, 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 we. All the way home. Ironically, in its hasty pull to include everybody, the terrifying exclusions of this mundane pronoun are exposed. And now, in the shadow of the so-called Anthropocene, where run-of-the-mill racialized heteropatriarchy meets and amplifies environmental devastation, the question of we is more salient than ever. As Michif pollution scientist Max Leboiron has written, when it comes to our culpability for planetary extinction as much as to our precarity in the face of the damage, quote, there is no such thing as we. Leboiron continues, terms like the Anthropocene, or arguments that we are destroying the planet, or we must all band together as one, miss forces like colonialism and other differences in how pollution, discarding, and extraction have continually benefited some types and groups of people and burdened others. We are all in this together, but who is waving and who is drowning? Solidarity is pretty cheap when it can be simply proclaimed with a signature on a petition or a blacked out box on Instagram. The rubber hits the road when we start to consider whose body bears the burdens of our collectively rendered age of man. 
in this time of climate catastrophe, augmented by a global pandemic, with its grotesquely uneven distribution of vulnerability, just who do we think we are? This question ebbs and flows across my feet as a persistent but mostly unnoticed tide. Part two, inhabiting the error. And yet not saying we feels impossible. You've been tripping over it constantly since you tuned in. So how can I denounce it at the same time as it swims so freely through the circulation of my speech? I'm brought back to ruminations once offered by US feminist theorist Robin Wiegman about a decade ago, where she too contemplated the false altogetherness of feminism. Yes, we, she wrote, that towering inferno of universalism, that monstrous display of self-infatuation, that masterstroke of white woman speech. Wiegman hears voices warning her away from the danger, as do I. But like Wiegman, I too want to persist. If the protocols of critical speech have taught us to avoid the risk, Wiegman writes, it is just as true to say that these same critical philosophies also harbor some measure of hope that we will struggle into existence. Partial and impermanent for sure, but not without power and meaningfulness. The we keeps coming back because we can't let it go. Sarah Ahmed also recognizes something like this. She writes, to build feminist dwellings, we need to dismantle what has already been assembled. We need to ask what it is we are against and what it is we are for, knowing full well that this we is not a foundation, but what we are working toward. By working out what we are for, Ahmed sums up, we are working out that we, that hopeful signifier of a feminist collectivity. And what else have we got? Robin Wiegman notes that the alternative to we, that is, safe refuge in the small cave of the eye, it's not an option. She concludes, quote, in the taut space between the we that must be disciplined and the we that is desired, my strategy is to inhabit the error, not to avoid it. So what can water and understanding ourselves as bodies of water in a watery world teach us about inhabiting the error of the we? Is there something less solid than solidarity to easily claimed? Is there something more confluent than the small cave of the eye? Part three, finding a way back. In a surprising poetic revelation, cultural studies theorist of water, Janine McLeod, once pointed out that in all of our anthropogenic damming of waters, bottling of lakes, channelization of creeks, concrete separating of rivers from the soft fingers of the riparian fringe, in all of this watery containment and re-choreography, Janine said, water must be really lonely. Water is always trying to find its way back. Water is social. We feel that in the way it circulates. Even the stillest of puddles quivers with the approach of another body. As bodies of water, we are sensitive to the presence of others. We pool. This material sociality is not only spatial to rivulets converging at a dip in the sand, but it tumbles in a temporal cascade too. Human bodies ingest reservoir bodies while reservoir bodies are slaked by rain bodies. Rain bodies fall into ocean bodies, ocean bodies aspirate fish bodies, fish bodies are consumed by whale bodies, which eventually die and sink 
to the seafloor as marine snow, to rot and be swallowed up again by the ocean's dark belly. When water leaves one body, it is already seeking out another. Or from the other shore, we could say that the next body is already pulling it in. Although it may seem that water is always leaving, if we are all bodies of water, then we could also say, no, water is just finding its way back. We notice that amongst all of this watery conviviality, water is always becoming different. As Charles Darwin once quipped, our ancestor was an animal which breathed water, had a swim bladder, a great swimming tail, an imperfect skull, and was undoubtedly a hermaphrodite. Darwin's pleasant genealogy reminds us of our evolutionary fishy beginnings, whereby all terrestrial life came from the sea folding that marine habitat inside of ourselves as we learned to stand on our own two feet. Water's continual differentiation has been the name of the game for over four billion years. Our planet produces no water in addition to that which has always been here. Yet it is not in spite of, but rather because of water's closed system that its embodiment in the world is so open. It is only because of difference that water continues to generate itself. Water is always seeking out difference, even as its brute materiality, one might say, seemingly repeats. It is water's sociality, its refusal of permanent containment that invites difference to proliferate and grow. What if water were the only common language we needed? A language that is nonetheless, as Donna Haraway might say, a wild and infidel heteroglossia. What if hydrofeminism, a feminism always learning from and with water, were the kind of blasphemous feminism that Haraway called for? Blasphemy, she wrote in her famous cyborg manifesto, protects one from the moral majority within while still insisting on the need for community. Haraway was interested in the tension of holding incompatible things together because both or all are necessary and true, she wrote. In our embrace of difference, Haraway insisted, we cannot give up on the confusing task of making partial, real connection. So where does that leave us, socially, politically, divided in our vulnerability and suspicious of structures of power that still burden us unequally? Are we all in this together? Perhaps water reminds us of the dead end of binary binary thinking. When asked, are you this or that, with us or against us, here or there, now or then, water's reply is simply yes, yes, and. We are all in this together, and we are all in this together differently. Water is this kind of difference. To be in common as watery bodies is to insist on this difference. Here swims the beautiful, difficult, irresolvable paradox of we. A we whose error is dangerous, but one that nonetheless lures us in. Finding our way back to the words of Adrian Rich, we might affirm, we who are water, and we who do not want to be the same.